hello there and welcome back guys. It's finally time for the next part of my FT17 build. In the last part I built the kit right out of the box and made some additions with green stuff. This part will be all about the painting, weathering and working on the included diorama base. And without further ado, let's get straight into it. First I have to deconstruct everything into smaller sub-assemblies. It's necessary because of the way the tracks are designed. Otherwise you would have no chance to do any painting in between them and the hull. Because I already did the interior painting in the previous part, I have to cover up the inside with foam. Regular acrylic paint has a hard time sticking to metal than the usual plastic. To help with this, I cover the visible metal parts with a metal primer from Tamiya. After looking at some reference pictures, I noticed a visible texture on the larger panels. To replicate this effect, I just have to use a small amount of extra thin cement from Tamiya. Then I stipple an old brush over the surface, creating a very fine texture. And now I can finally begin the painting. As usual, the first layer is a base coat in Vallejo's Mecha Primer Black. The primer itself could be used straight out of the bottle, but I like to add a few drops of flow improver to make the paint run smoother. This also has the side effect of making cleaning the airbrush later easier. I chose a 3-tone camo for this one. The base layer is made with Ammo by Mix Warm Sand Yellow thinned with acrylic thinner. This is my first time using these MIG acrylics with an airbrush on a larger scale. And I have to say, I really like them. I would say they have slightly less opacity than AK's 3rd gen acrylics, but they flow very smooth and I never had any problems with the clocked nozzle. This is the pattern I will try to replicate. For that I am using masking putty. Filming how to add this putty is not great, so I am skipping right to the result. For the brown parts I used Ammo by Mick Earth Brown. On a lighter base tone like this, the color really has an excellent opacity and I just needed one or two thin coats for everything. The whole masking process is then repeated for the green parts. Just make sure to give the previous paint enough time to dry before applying the putty again. The green used here is called Pale Green and is again part of the French tank color set made from Ammo by Mick. Here I don't really bother priming the tracks black first and instead just use the dark tracks color on them directly. And these are the parts after removing all the masking. There are a few edges that I don't like and the camo on the running gear should line up with the hull, but I can fix these parts easier with a brush. I temporarily added the hedges again to make it easier to continue the camo pattern on them. Of course the green needs the same kind of fixing as the brown. I saw some pictures from a camo pattern where the individual colors were divided with dark black lines. Since I felt the pattern looked sort of empty like this and unfinished, I decided to add them to my tank as well. And this is the tank with all the basic acrylic painting done. The dark lines look a little bit weird right now, but as I already know how the end result will look while recording this, I can say adding them was the right choice. Now I can begin with the weathering. One of the simplest techniques is sponge chipping. I add chips in the same color as my base coat over the brown and green parts. Using a sponge is really helpful here, 
not only is the pattern more random and smaller, but it also highlights the edges and raised details without any problem. I can go really strong on the chipping here, given that this tank was heavily used in a rough environment like No Man's Land. It's a really nice comparison to the Abrams I built earlier, where I could do almost no chipping, and here I can almost destroy the tank with chipping. And next are the deeper chips that would go straight into the metal. For them I chose Vallejo German Grey. When using a sponge for chipping, you have to make sure to only use a very small amount of paint on the sponge itself. Otherwise you may end up with very large and out of scale chips, so make sure to load off most of the paint on a paper towel. I can only imagine the running gear would look really beat up with it completely exposed to all the explosions and obstacles on the battlefield. I made a few smaller chips into larger ones with a fine brush. If you are careful you can also try to add some scratches. Just make sure to only have a very small amount of paint on the brush. Now I can add the included decals. According to the instructions, these are for the 2nd Platoon, 1st Company, 344th Tank Battalion, 304th Tank Brigade, US Army, Verdun, October 1918. So it's not really a French tank, but a US tank made by the French. To fix them I use Microset and Microsol accordingly. I didn't bother with a clear coat before applying the decals this time, because they are so small and the surface they are attached to are very flat. Before I can continue now, I have to seal and protect the acrylics with a clear coat. The weathering is done with enamel colors, which could attack and damage the water-based acrylic colors if I don't seal them properly. A gloss varnish will also help to let the washes I want to use flow better into and all around the details and panel lines. And for that wash, I am using a premix this time called Winter Streaking Grime from AK. I really like using this one because it's slightly green and not just a dark brown like most of the other washes you can buy. First I cover the area I want to work on with white spirit. That way the wash has no difficulties to flow around the many rivets this tank has as well as into the panel lines. And because the entire surface is covered in thinner, blending in the excess is very easy to do and almost happens by itself. For a vehicle like this, a wash is absolutely necessary to bring out all the individual rivets and details. Just take a look at the difference between the side I have already applied the wash on and the empty side. Now I have to start working on the mud effects. As the base layer, I chose Thick Ground from Ammo by Mick. This effect is applied over all the lower parts of the hull. Because this is an enamel based product, I have to use White Spirit to blend the edges. 
Compared to a water-based acrylic mud, this allows you to create much smoother edges and gives you more time to modify it before it dries. And to add more volume, I just add another layer once the first one begins to dry. For some color variation, I added some dry light soil. And with white spirit, you can blend the two colors together to create a smooth gradient between them. I let these two colors dry completely before I can continue with any more effects. A darker, more diluted mud called turned earth is then added to the bottom simulating fresher and wetter mud. And this is how they look after drying. I have to say I really like how it turned out. Next up is more weathering for the top half. I added streaking grime in vertical lines from the top to the bottom and then dragged them down with a weathering brush. I am done with the enamel effects for now. Furthermore, I would like to experiment a bit with pigments on this kit. I rarely use them and when I do, I tend to use them in small quantities. But here I would like to create a strong dirt deposit with them. The main pigment I will be using is called Europe Earth from AK Interactive. I add the pigment in small piles randomly over the previously made effects. I want to keep the texture from the pigment to stay, that's why I don't do any smoothing. The pigments are fixed with a pigment fixer. When applying I have to be careful to not move the pigments too much and rather let the glue run into the pigment. To accelerate the drying time I can just sprinkle some more pigments into the wet glue. And after drying, everything is matte again. And the pigments are firmly connected to the rest. It really nicely kept its texture, which looks like dry and stuck mud. And after all that time, I can finally put the hull and the running gears together. For that I am using super glue, because all these surfaces have been covered with paint and enamel effects, so the usual cement would not work. Again, more pigments are needed for all the horizontal surfaces. It's the same procedure as before. Working with pigments can be very messy. That's why I keep an additional piece of paper underneath to collect any loose pigment. I will weather the tracks once they are attached to the tank. For that I have to use super glue again.
I take a small amount of enamel mud and put it on the rear part of each track link. I push the mud towards this small raised part on each link. Here some of the dirt would be stuck and not fall off so fast. To do the final touches of weathering, I want to add the tank to the diorama base. But for that I first have to make the base ready. I already filled all the gaps with putty and sanded them down. To upgrade the texture, I am adding a layer of this acrylic mud from AK. This texture looks much more in scale than the molded plastic parts. But here I made a mistake that will haunt me later, as you will see. And this is how the mud looks once it's dry. It has a really nice look, but in my opinion it's way too dark compared to the weathering I did on the tank. That's why I decided to prime it black and repaint it all with a lighter tone. The colors I chose were Old Wood from Vallejo and Deck Tan from AK. I chose the colors to be very desaturated and cold, because I think these colors would fit better in the general feeling of a World War I diorama. It looks much better now, and the texture looks even better too. And now comes the mistake I mentioned. Because I also covered the position where the tank was supposed to go, the tracks are no longer touching the ground always. That means I have to add additional mud under each track to fill it up. The closest color I had was this light brown mud, but that will still need additional blending later. This step took about an hour of extra time, so hopefully I will keep that in mind for the next diorama. At least I added a tree trunk for this one. You can still clearly tell the two colors apart, but I have to wait for everything to dry, so I can continue the blending process. In the meantime, I can put the final pigments onto the tracks. Like before, they are added in small piles, which are then held in place with pigment fixer. Although I have changed my mind and will keep the hatches on the turret closed, I still want to leave the driver's cabin open. The mud is dry, but the difference is still too visible in my opinion. That's why I will cover the entire ground in the same pigment as I used on the tank itself. I just have to mix a decent amount with white spirit and have made my own liquid pigment. I then apply this texture generously over the entire ground and tracks. When everything is dry, the pigment becomes lighter again and is completely matte. And this looks much better than before. And now you can hardly tell a difference between the two ground colors. 
for the final touches I am going back to the enamel effects, this time for some mud splashes. I add some of it to my brush and then blow air with my airbrush onto it. This creates some really fine splashes all over the ground and the tank itself. And now all that is left is to repaint the sides black and it's time for the final result. I have to say for such a small tank this turned out to be quite a big project and took me longer than I expected. Nonetheless this was a really nice kit and I enjoyed building and weathering everything. How do you think this turned out? Feel free to let me know in the comments. I am still not sure what the next project will be, so if you have any wishes let me know. If you enjoyed it, please like the video and subscribe to my channel to not miss any future uploads. If you have any feedback or suggestions let me know in the comments. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.